Good evening from New York. This is Wednesday, November 16th, 356 days until the 2012 presidential election. Occupy Wall Street showing resilience. Occupy protesters elsewhere showing theirs too, especially 84-year-old Dorley Rainey, pepper sprayed by Seattle police last night in a crowd that also included a pregnant woman and a priest. The fifth story in the countdown, Occupy Wall Street regrouping after Tuesday morning shutdown of their camp at Sakati Park, preparing for an international day of action tomorrow, with protests planned in many Occupy cities, including New York, L.A., Portland, London, and Madrid, after protesters in Baltimore tried to occupy Bush's brain, Karl Rove. Starting tonight in Seattle, this is Dorley Rainey, 84-year-old activist, self-described old lady in combat boots. She was hit with pepper spray last night when she stopped to check out an Occupy Seattle protest. Occupy Seattle reporting that a priest and a pregnant woman also pepper sprayed after protesters blocking downtown streets were attacked by the police. There were six arrests. Dorley was not one of them. Seattle police spokesman Jeff Capel tried to defend the action, saying pepper spray, quote, is not age-specific, no more dangerous to someone who is 10 or someone who is 80. Dangerous to someone who is a fetus? Activist Dorley Rainey will be our guest in just a few moments. At Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, a spray of blather, not pepper spray, from Carl Rove uh, interrupted abruptly when Occupy protesters called for a mic check before reminding Rove of his credentials, architect of Occupy Iraq and Occupy Afghanistan. Carl didn't like that. <laughs> We are the 99%. You want to keep jumping up and yelling, you're the 99%? How presumptuous and arrogant can you think you are? No, you're not. Carl, did you say all that? What a guy. By the way, the answer to your first question, Carl, who gave them the right to occupy America? The Constitution. I know you've never read it, but there's some good stuff in there. Zagati Park looking sadly empty this morning. Just police, security guards, and a handful of demonstrators to start with, while other Occupy protesters lined up at a sanitation garage to retrieve what was left of their property after police and sanitation workers had carted it off. The Zagati Library wants at least 4,000 books, maybe 5,500, reduced to a few boxes in this picture. Perhaps New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg could add them to his library. He might use them to look up something he's never seen before, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Documents that seem to have been read in Boston, where a judge today granted Occupy a temporary restraining order that would keep the city from closing down the camp at Dewey Square without first getting a court order. While in Philadelphia, the Occupy camp at Dilworth Plaza has received a different sort of order, an eviction notice to clear the ground so a renovation project can start there. Back at Zuccotti, Occupy Wall Street protesters putting yesterday's crackdown behind them and preparing for major protests tomorrow. Obviously, when you're looking at the park, it's, it's a little bit empty, so of course you're going to think, oh no, it's over, no, absolutely not. We, we have the internet, <laughs> and we use it, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's far from over. The presence is smaller today, a lot of people are sleeping, and a lot of people are preparing for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is a very big day. It's a day of international action on November 17th. That includes plans to shut down streets in and around downtown Los Angeles and to march from the Occupy camp at London St. Paul's Cathedral, which is also facing eviction. And while Occupy Oakland's camp is closed, Iraq War veteran and Occupy activist Scott Olson is on the way back, releasing his first photo since he was hit with a police tear gas canister last month. Also this statement, I'm feeling a lot better with a long road in front of me after my freedom of speech was quite literally taken from me. My speech is coming back, but I've got a lot of work to do with rehab. Thank you for all your support. It has meant the world to me. You'll be hearing more from me in the near future, and soon enough, we'll see you in our streets. Every time you might think you had seen the worst of the establishment's response to Occupy, somebody, somewhere, is willing to bet you you have not. Let's go to Seattle, where Occupy protesters were pepper sprayed last night. Among them, political activist and Occupy Seattle supporter, Dorley Rainey. It's a great pleasure to have you on the program tonight. Thank you, Keith. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, before we get uh, into last night, we've seen the pictures, so the obvious question is, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. I feel so energized. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what a little pepper spray will do for you. <laughs> it seems to have that effect on people who know they're in the right. How did you get involved in all that last night? Can you tell us? Well, I first of all, I've been involved in uh, uh, all these actions, whether it was uh, uh, civil rights, the women's rights, mm. uh, and now this, uh, 
So this is a natural progression for me. And I was in uh, D.C. with the October, 20, the October 2011 group mm -hmm. from the 6th to the 10th of October, which was uh, exhilarating to hear these great speakers that we had there. Uh, when I came back, I was totally overcharged to start working here. Mm. So yesterday, I was on my way to one of these boring uh, uh, transportation meetings. When I got off my bus to change to another one, I heard tons of helicopters overhead. You could not hear yourself think. And I thought, well, as probably Occupy Seattle is doing a uh, an action there to help out so Occupied Wall Street. And I decided to go up there and check it out. And sure enough, uh, right in front of the Nordstrom store at the big intersection, there was, uh, first of all, a, an army of uh, police officers, mm -hmm. bicycles, cars, lights, etc. And the people were in the center of that intersection blocking traffic all around. Uh, a lot of my friends were there, and my friends consist of uh, all age groups, mm -hmm. all colors. Uh, no matter what some of the media say, that they're rats and they're crazy and druggies, etc. That is just not so. So I, I stood around there with my friends, and we were just deciding that we had stayed there long enough, and we might go on. Well. We're not a secret society, and when somebody says, mic check, everybody can hear it. And the cops also knew that we were on the verge of leaving. Just at that moment, the bike, bike patrol came up and shoved bicycles into the crowd, mm -hmm. moving them to the center. Uh, and simultaneously, they let go of the pepper spray. And in the pictures, you can see where the pepper spray came all over. Um, so I got pepper sprayed and shoved. And thank heavens, there was a wonderful young Iraq veteran who stood next to me. And he says, he, he grabbed me as I stumbled, as people were pushing. People couldn't see where they were going. The cops kept pushing with the bicycles. And the space we were in got smaller and smaller, so we were really penned in. Um, and that young man stabilized me. Otherwise, I would have been on the ground, mm. trampled. Good. And this really is not a good picture to think about. Uh, so after that, then, uh, uh, some people helped me to go back to the bus, and I went home. But the great thing is that I ride these buses an awful lot, and some of the people, I see them at least once or twice a week on the bus, hello, how are you? And they said, what happened to you? I, I had no mirror, so I must have looked a fright. <laughs> and, and the bus driver said, hey, what happened to you? I said, I got pepper sprayed by Seattle's finest. And the other people piped up and said, oh, that's terrible. And the wonderful thing that happened was this bus full of people started talking about Occupy. And, and they had never seen a real person that they could identify with who got pepper sprayed. And it became a really wonderful educational opportunity for me to convert a busload full of people to our way of thinking. Is that your hope for what this is going to do uh, for, for America, that it's going to, more than, more than anything else, going to educate people to what they're up against? We have to do that. And with the time is of the essence. Uh, we are seeing the FCC now trying to take away the uh, free internet. Uh, I remember Goebbels. I remember the time I grew up over there. Mm. And I remember the shrinking of the print media. Uh, and we had one newspaper, and it was called the Völkische Beobachter, the People's Observer. Mm -hmm. And it was the same from North Germany down to South Austria. Uh, 
same uh, propaganda. We're winning the war, we're sinking the U-boats, and we're into Scotland. And so it, we were doing so well, it's amazing how long the war lasted after we were winning it already. <laughs> And I see the same thing happening here. We have really no more free media that will bring you the issues instead of just the soft, fluff entertainment, the repeated stuff about some actress somewhere being pregnant and not pregnant and wanting to go get married and not. This should be on the entertainment pages, but not on the mainstream news media. So we have, we have such incredible issues here. Right here in our town, we live 20 miles from Ground Zero, the Bangor Missile Base. Mm -hmm. And in order to get any attention from any media, we go there and we occupy the street going into the Missile Base. And we get arrested there, and nobody cares. Nobody says anything except the people who want to drive in and out of the base mm -hmm. and earn their living there. They don't much like us. But we have uh, one of my heroes was a Catholic nun who spread her blood on a missile silo in Colorado and got incarcerated, and then she did an action in Tennessee and got incarcerated. incarcerated. Uh, she, uh, her name was Jackie Hudson. She recently died, and a lot of it was the cause of the mistreatment in the uh, prison system mm -hmm. in Tennessee. Uh, she used to say, whatever you do, take one more step mm -hmm. out of your comfort zone. And that is what I do. I take a step out of my comfort zone. It was so easy to say, well, I'm going to retire. I'm going to sit around, watch television, or eat bonbons. <laughs> but somebody's got to keep them awake and let them know what is really going on in this world, whether it's um, J.P. Morgan, uh, doing the financing plan for our ill-fated tunnel, which is coming up, mm -hmm. which the uh, city council, some member even admitted they never read the environmental impact right, statement right. because it is boring. Mm -hmm. Well, I read the whole dang thing, and my eyeballs are still pink from reading it. And, and nobody talks about these things. Mm -hmm. They are not in the media, and the Chamber of Commerce pushes things like our tunnel because they will earn big profits when they start developing the properties around there when the tunnel when the viaduct is gone. And the taxpayers are online for this. And so I I'm an issues person, I always have been. Mm -hmm. So is this what you wanted to hear? Yes, <laughs> Do you it, have any questions? No, that's <laughs> uh, you have answered all of my questions. Uh, and you're one of my heroes now. Dorley Rainey, political activist, Occupy Seattle supporter, and one of those punk kids out there on the streets. Uh, a, an honor to have you on the program. Keep going one step outside your comfort zone. We'll try to do the same thing here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, how does a New York City councilman not only wind up bruised and bloodied and arrested at Occupy Wall Street, but then detained for 17 hours without access to his lawyer, and the mayor pretends nothing untoward has happened? Councilman Idanas Rodriguez joins me next. This is Countdown. <laughs>